19 pandemic when a lot of dynamics were pretty much disrupted. Um, and I think the trick is now, um, you know, we, we've now kind of uh, planted some seeds uh, on this continent in terms of uh, manufacturing of biotech, medical products, health technologies, etc. We can talk about those kinds of definitions now and how do we ensure that we take this momentum forward. So let's get to it. We have 45 minutes, so we will stop at half past. And we're basically going to uh, do this as a fireside chat uh, between myself and uh, Stavros. Um, and please, I would like to ask that if any anything is triggered, please do feel free to put up your hand. There's a microphone over there, and then you can, or you can just go up to the microphone and just interject in the conversation. If there's no interjections, then I will give us about 10, 15 minutes at the end to have a discussion. But um, I often find, I don't know about you guys, but myself, I'm listening to something that I think, oh, I'm gonna ask this question at the end and then I forget about it. So if you're really thinking, if something uh, gnaws at you while we're having a conversation, or you think we are rear rearing off, um, please do feel free to just jump up and alert me and I'll just bring you into the conversation. So first, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Dr. Loise Manzi. Um, I'm the head of secretariat of President Ramaphosa's COVID-19 Commission. Um, which, as you will know, he established in his capacity as the appointed uh, champion on COVID-19. Um, as you will, as you may recall, uh, in 2020, President Ramaphosa was the chair of the AU um, when we were then suddenly struck with COVID-19. And during his tenure, he established about uh, 12 initiatives, things like the AVID, the African Medicine Supplies Platform, um, et cetera, the, the, um, uh, Af the uh, I wanna say the epidemic fund, it was called the COVID-19 relief fund, we're converting it now, but we'll come to that just now. Um, and and uh, saving lives and livelihoods and all sorts of other uh, very, very critical initiatives to ensure that Africa, uh, through Africa CDC, and through uh, uh, now Ambassador Nginga Song's very able leadership, we were able to plug the gaps that are frankly left um, by the global health architecture to ensure that this continent um, is able to mount an effective COVID-19 response. And uh, I think we, you know, we've done very well. Um, of course, the major impediment was the issue of access, which really at the end of the day, when we talk about manufacturing on the continent, it comes down to an issue of access. Um, but be that as it may, despite the headwinds that we faced, uh, we were able to actually, as Africa, organize quite well and mount quite an effective COVID-19 response um, strategy. Now, uh, following uh, the, the president's uh, tenureship uh, and his uh, appointment as the COVID-19 champion, the job was now to really consolidate um, all of these mechanisms that were set up and now actually start through the new public health order start to um, uh, institutionalize um, these uh, establishments and prepare for future pandemics. And part of this preparation is also establishing binding agreements between member states to ensure that the next time we are faced with the COVID-19 pandemic, we are actually bound to a cooperative framework that ensures that everybody actually stays together and doesn't start to veer off when they feel like the, that, the, that the health threat is no longer an issue for them. Now this is very critical because we did see in the COVID-19 pandemic that in the beginning when the issue um, was, uh, was an urgent issue, everybody came together and sang Kumbaya and said that we're going to work together. But when it came down to the crunch, um, sovereign interests uh, triumphed and this then actually brought us to this access crunch that we uh, experienced um, on this continent. We called it vaccine apartheid, or we, called, you know, or we called it all sorts of things, but it really came down to an issue of, um, at the end of the day, uh, when it's really, really critical, uh, me as a sovereign state, I must look out um, for my people first. And if you're a high income country, that's all very well, if you're a middle income country like ours, it can, be, it can become quite tricky and we'll talk a bit about that as well. And if you're, if you're a low income country, then you're dependent on certain organizations and certain mechanisms um, of, of, of which one of the critical ones for COVID-19 was your COVAX mechanism, what was your ACT-A mechanism. And we can have a frank discussion about um, 
uh, its impact and what it actually was in fact able to achieve and whether it was in fact able to overcome the market forces that it was supposed to do um, to um, uh, deliver um, on access uh, to medical countermeasures. So we're going to have then a conversation about this because at the end of the day, what we've realized is that um, the issue of the market um, and um, market dynamics, market forces can no longer kind of stand up on its own and do its own thing, you know, which, ha which has been um, the major issue of the past and everybody's had to scramble around the market. And we wanted to see, is it possible for us to, to fundamentally disrupt the market so that the market itself becomes an agent of access, equitable access to healthcare. Um, and, and we ensure that in fact the ethos that drives access is the issue of providing universal health coverage and not an issue of trying to navigate the markets and uh, trying to make them work for us. The markets must work for health, not the other way around. So it's really uh, a pleasure for me to, to be able to have this discussion. Stavros, uh, Nicolau, uh, lovely to have you. The topic of this discussion, of course, is um, financing manufacturing in Africa, a roundtable dialogue. But I have premised um, this discussion, of course, so that we make sure that at the end of the day, we focus on what really the important issue is. And it's, it's, it's really an issue of financing manufacturing so that Africa actually, uh, Africans have access uh, to medical countermeasures. Um, and just, uh, I, I know most of you in this room, uh, Stavros doesn't uh, need any introduction, but uh, just to get the formalities out, out of the way, uh, Mr. Stavros Nicola is a member of the Aspen Pharmacare Holdings Limited Group Executive Committee and is the group's senior executive responsible for strategic trade development. Uh, over 31 years of experience in the South African, uh, I should say African and international pharmaceutical industry, Ms. Nicola was instrumental in introducing the first generic ARVs on the African continent developed by Aspen, which has saved thousands of lives in South Africa and on the African continent. Uh, so Stavros, welcome. Uh, great to be here with you at home. Ekakasi <laughs> niteguini. Um, so, Stavros, let me start, um, I've got my questions here, but I, I want to firstly maybe start with a little bit of history, and let's go to this issue of, of ARVs, right? And um, why don't you take us back, because we were having this discussion with some other colleagues about the issue of ARVs, you know, that we've been, we, we, what we've been through with COVID, we've been here before. <laughs> so what happened, why didn't we learn? But maybe if you can just take us back to where we started with ARVs, what needed to happen, and what kind of policies we needed to introduce to the world to drive the prices down, what it took, um, what it took for us to actually have access, uh, you know, the modalities of um, the, the, the medication itself, the market dynamics that had to be overcome, and, um, you know, how did we get to the point where we are today as South Africa where we are the largest providers um, of, of ARVs. So I think if you can give us five minutes, and what I'd like you to do in those five minutes as you're telling us the story, is I want you to start picking out the elements from COVID-19, you know, that um, kind of was kind of like history repeating itself, so that we can actually really start to learn lessons and, and, and move forward and um, see what it's going to actually take to really disrupt the situation. <coughs> Luazi, uh, thanks very much, and uh, it's, uh, le let me first of all thank you. It does feel like I've known you for four decades, <laughs> but um, we should probably thank the audience here. These are like real diehards, so we better give them value for money, Luazi, <laughs> between you and I. Um, they've, uh, they, they, they could have chosen any other session and chose this one, mm. so let's try and make it worth your while. Uh, great to be in KZN, as long as you don't tell me, uh, they call me in Fanoa Giti, <laughs> then I'll, I'll start worrying. Um, le let me cover some of the thematics and the topics that you that you spoke about. So le let's cast our minds back. Some of you might be too young in this audience, like Judy, to remember. <laughs> but let's cast our minds back to uh, 1999, 2000 in our country. 
and, and Chris Whitfield's going to relate to the story as well in a few moments. For the first time, we were coming to terms with the magnitude of the HIV crisis in our country. We were kind of in a, a bit of denial. Um, the, the policy of the administration of the day was a bit ambiguous, as we know. But what we knew for certain is that in 2000, 2001, we were losing uh, around 350,000 mainly young South Africans. To, to say that uninterrupted that was going to cause probably the biggest crisis that our country had known would have been an understatement. And that's why kind of when COVID came around and we said, well, you know, this is the first time we're having to manage this, it actually wasn't the first time because we didn't lose 350,000 lives, I don't think, um, during COVID. We, we lost a few hundred thousand, but it wasn't anything like what we were seeing. 350 to 400,000 perishing, these are, are countrymen, fellow citizens, perishing every year. And as I said, unarrested, this would have significantly in impacted the economic backbone of the country, the future of the country, because you, use your, you lose your young people, you lose your young, talent, your young talent, you don't have a future, unfortunately. So we started understanding the magnitude of what we were facing. So the next thing was, well, how do you start managing this situation? Because you've got an administration that was a little ambiguous on, on its policy. And the antiretrovirals in those days, so those of you who are young enough, like me, will remember, first line, triple cocktail was um, lamivudine, stavudine, and levirapine, or later on efavirenz came about. And in the U.S., you would pay up to $10,000 per patient per year. Now, how on earth are you going to make this accessible in South Africa at those price tags? Not possible. Uh, a lot of heated debates, a lot of social activism. Ma many, many new NGOs came to the fore. And all sorts of proposals were put on the table. And I'm going to edge towards the first lesson. One of the proposals was to hell with patents, let's just abrogate the patents and let's breach them and just do our own thing. Okay. Another proposal was let's invoke um, uh, Article 31 E and F of TRIPS and let's go ahead and compulsory license. Okay. In Thailand, we're looking at doing the same thing. So this became a very heated and an emotional debate because you had people dying on the one hand, you had an administration that was uh, ambiguous with its HIV policy, and then you had uh, a whole lot of people weighing in on IP issues and kind of like all of us were saying, well, who cares about any of this? It's all about saving lives. Saving lives means you've got to get the price tag down to an affordable level. So what did we do? We sat around the table, as, 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 as in those days voluntary licenses didn't exist, sat around a table in Wazi and said, how do we as South Africans solve this problem? We're very good when our backs are against the wall at sitting down and finding solutions. We, we had done it, whether it was in Codessa, a decade before that, wherever it was, South Africans are generally very good at sitting down and finding common solutions. And that's what we did. Um, it, it involved some clandestine meetings because there was a health minister that uh, she's deceased now, of course, and may she rest in peace. But if she had even heard that we were having discussions with her officials, all hell would have broken loose. So anyway, government, multinational R&D companies, ourselves, patient groupings, with a little weight and leaning from the competition commission, we should never underestimate them, right? We got it right to issue voluntary licenses. Okay, now, voluntary licenses meant that the patent holder would license to us, the licensee, 
under certain terms and in return we would make these medicines accessible and affordable to the population so the price has went down from the 10,000 it was anything between 8 and 10,000 dollars per patient per year got it down to 180 dollars per patient per year that went on to save many hundreds of thousands of lives in our country and on the continent okay so what are the take out lessons here okay lesson number one is when you're in a public health crisis quite frankly you don't have the time the luxury of time to sit and debate whether you're going for rp waivers or you're going for this or that you just don't have the luxury of time rather sit around a table with the multinationals now the most significant sit down was actually with Gilead Sciences and Chris is here representing Gilead Sciences because they had the magic bullet called Tenofovir and we went we graduated from the first agreement which was Bristol Myers Squibb so these are all lessons that have been learned Bristol Myers Squibb would not give a voluntary license but they said we will give you immunity of suit okay so this is BMS the Princeton we'll give you immunity of suit you've got to develop your own product we graduated from immunity of suit to voluntary license to then when we signed with Gilead it was a voluntary license uh, manufacture distribution and technology transfer agreement okay so that's what happened so these things graduated now some of the other lessons here why would anyone want to give you their tech you might ask me now why transfer your tech okay and and by the way the royalties were very low and Gilead later waived the royalties altogether incidentally it wasn't only Gilead it was GSK it was Merck all followed a very similar model so you pay a small royalty but then you can within the confines of the uh, geographic territory that they've given you you can go and commercialize the product make it accessible and make it affordable but you cannot do any of that unless you have local manufacturing capacity so had Aspen not had local capacity at its plant in what was then Port Elizabeth now Quebec okay hundreds of thousands of lives would have been lost I can assure you because the only reason when you're dealing with a Gilead Chris and a very interesting story by the way because in 2003 Aspen signed with the Clinton Foundation it went with three companies it was Aspen the only African company and then you had Cipla and you had Rambaxi okay. so in January 2004 myself and my colleague Lorraine arrive at the head office of Gilead in Foster City and now we're going to meet the group Exco uh, the late John Martin is uh, this is like going in to meet uh, <laughs> cabinet right and I'm sitting in reception and I'm looking at uh, what's going on in reception and I look up and there's a massive portrait of Donald Rumsfeld okay on the because Donald Rumsfeld was the previous chairman of Gilead so I said to Lorraine, you know, I'm not quite sure where Gilead kind of sits. I found later, I found out later on. I'm not sure where they sit with the, the Republicans and Democrats and all the rest of it. So wherever we've got Clinton's photo, remove it, please. <laughs> and she said, are you sure? But this is like a Trump card. I said, oh, no, no, let's just be, let's just learn our politics of the situation first. And that was another lesson, right? So I'm not saying it would have influenced things. But you've got to also look at politically now it might sound like a real anecdotal example that i'm giving you right but it's it just demonstrates and gilead were fine i mean they, they they didn't favor any particular you know republican or democrat but what it did demonstrate to me is you've got to understand the politics on the ground as well and we landed the deal we were able to make tanoff of affordable and together between Gilead and Aspen, we saved hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lives, Chris. So these are all kind of the lessons that you start learning along the way. 
Okay, but the lessons like I keep stressing, the most important one is without local capacity, none of these companies would have given us a voluntary license. We would not be able to produce the product. We would not be able to bring the prices down to $180. Now let me go back to what I was saying earlier. Why would a multinational R&D based company uh, who, who earns their future revenue from a pipeline of innovative products want to give um, a product for a, for a mega royalty to a company in South Africa or on the African continent for that matter? Okay, the answer is very simple. Multinational companies through their innovation model, the R&D model, the pipeline that comes, it's where they earn their future revenue to offset what they've spent on R&D. They set a floor price, a global floor price. Okay. They're not going to move below that floor price. So even today, if we're looking at whatever it is, biologics for oncology, they're not going to shift materially below that. Unless they partner someone that's got local capacity, then they can justify why they've gone in at a different tiered pricing level or whatever pricing model you use. So that kind of satisfies the needs of all the stakeholders, but most importantly, the healthcare systems and the patients. And we forgot all of this during COVID, Luwazi, unfortunately. And that's why I'm kind of giving chapter and verse here because we had an ideal blueprint and we discarded it during COVID. Amazing. So the stakeholders, just in conclusion, that this model works for is it works for R&D, okay, because they can continue commercializing their R&D pipelines in other markets. It solves the access problem, so the governments are happy. The patient groups are happy because you're making these medicines accessible and affordable. The local producers are happy because they can fill up their plants with volume, okay, and they can start investing further capex. And then, very lastly, it strengthens the healthcare systems. We should never underestimate that. I mean, imagine having to admit 500,000 people, 350,000 of who you know are going to die, right? Imagine the burden on the healthcare system. Whereas one tablet, a fixed dose combination today, which Lewazi knows well, she was involved in this, a fixed dose combination product today, you can, you, you, you can buy for 90 rand, right? It costs the state 90 rand or less actually. So it's more like 80 rand today. So just think about it. This bottle of water that Luwazi has got is like 10 bucks, right? So <laughs> ar around three days of drug supplies, one bottle of water. Imagine what that saves the healthcare system. So these were the lessons that we knew well, Luwazi. It's, it's just puzzling that we got caught up in the midst of this I can only call it this global, panic, frenzied, anxious moment. And we kind of forgot all the lessons. We started putting all these things, RP issues back on the table. And, you know, RP doesn't wait for patients and neither does a virus. Okay. So I think we need to learn. I think we've learned many lessons with COVID now. And we should never repeat some of these things that we forgot. Thanks, uh, Luwazi. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Stavros. You've done exactly what I was hoping you would do, um, and that is to highlight um, some of the issues uh, that actually uh, caused uh, some issues in our current COVID-19 response and the speed and the impact of the response. And before we come to local manufacturing, I want to pick up on two sectors um, that um, I, w I was wondering if there was a way of ensuring that they are also bound with the rest of the world to the SDG goals. So what you were saying is that there are a couple of elements that are critically important um, when you respond to an emergency. And in fact, when we think about responding to an emergency, we should be thinking 
about also the way that we deal with this growing crisis of, of um, this NCD epidemic, which we do have, but somehow it, it's, it's not being taken as seriously as infectious diseases. So the first issue was the issue of political will, right, that, that, that you spoke about. Um, and um, I think that the world is trying to really strengthen um, that issue through um, the WHO-led intergovernmental uh, uh, negotiating body, the INB. And as I said earlier, the thing that needs to be strengthened is the binding nature of um, the collective uh, preparedness and response. And we're doing the same thing as well here uh, in Africa. We had announced uh, the COVID-19 Commission that we'd be establishing the African Pandemic Preparedness and Response Authority as well as the Africa Epidemic Fund, which we are in the midst of doing right now. And again, that, that was, that's all about really, you know, getting that political will to be quite legally binding. Um, so that's the first um, aspect. The second aspect was um, the multi-sectoral um, uh, nature of the response. Now, civil society will necessarily be mobilized to do what it needs to do, activate and agitate for access, which it did very, very well. However, um, what didn't do very well was firstly, the trade sector, and secondly, the manufacturing sector, so or, or the industrialists themselves, right? The industrialists produced and um, uh, allowed or, or, just, or just continued to allow the markets to dictate, um, you know, uh, how, what was going to be happening to the pricing and where, in fact, the, the um, uh, countermeasures were going to go. The World Trade Organization and the trade sector um, essentially, uh, uh, when they were uh, faced with an opportunity to introduce reforms or to invoke, you know, some of, uh, some of the clauses that were going to allow us to, 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 to trade ideas, I'm just using general terms, uh, the process was essentially filibustered and, uh, and uh, delayed to the extent that by the time, we, you know, we got the first part, we, we got over the line of the first part, which is the vaccines waiver, um, it started to lose relevance because now, you know, there were voluntary license agreements, there's actually vaccines flowing through donations, etc., and the manufacturers have been able to now, you know, catch up and actually increase their production. Now, my question to you is, how do we, similarly like we're doing in the political sphere, you know, where we are strengthening uh, the cooperative response, you know, legally, how do we ensure that the World Trade Organization and industry actually also become signatories, uh, you know, of these arrangements? And in particular, appreciate the fact that the very same, particularly the World Trade Organization, the very same member states that are signatories to the SDGs, that are members of the UN, etc., do not see themselves or do not see the issues as separate, but rather as part of a critical ecosystem for future health security. Tawazi, thanks. Uh, I think that a multitude of questions so le let me just try and probably give sort of one consolidated response and and there are there are a couple of thematics that lead to this response i think the first thing is of course uh, we, we've got to realize when we're in the midst of a pandemic um, and and put you know your usually your most effective tool that you've got to fight any pandemic is, is a vaccine. I think, first of all, the scientific community was absolutely stellar. Uh, the fact that we were able to get a vaccine out in 321 days, there or thereabouts, is, is a significant human feat, um, unmatched almost. I know it caused a lot of problems in that it made people anxious, they, they would cut corners and all the rest of it. Well, I think the results are there to see. I mean, there were 12 billion doses of vaccines administered globally, and, and we can see that the population of the world hasn't shrunk by 80%, as suggested by some people, right? So I think we've got to recognize 
the, the excellence of the scientific community, including the self-same scientific community in our country and what they achieved. So le let me get that off my chest because I'm just a how did you fare in South Africa? Well, let me just give you five headlines and then I'm gonna go back to the WTO. So headline number one is we were the first to sequence the, the beta and the Omicron variants. Uh, and unfortunately, it had consequences, but you cannot uh, for one moment underestimate um, the, the medical and genomic excellence that, uh, that was part and parcel of that achievement. Secondly, we were the only emerging market that, uh, that had clinical trial arms for Pfizer, AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson, the three predominant vaccines, right? Number three, we ran the largest ever phase 3B implementation study anywhere in the world for a COVID vaccine, for COVID-19 vaccine. That was the Sesonke-1 study. And then number four, we ran Sesonke-2, which was a study uh, with respect to booster vaccines, also the largest. So in other words, the world benefited from the data of our scientists in this country because they were then able to, through this data, were able uh, to, to set their own uh, vaccine guidelines and protocols in the rest of the world. And we could work out things like vaccine efficacies and durability of vaccines and immunological responses and, and all the other things, right? That, so that, that came out of the South African scientific community. And then we were the first country in the Southern Hemisphere and on the African continent. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll try not to be too conflicted here. Luwazi, but Aspen were the first to produce a COVID-19 vaccine, right? And that was J&J having 10 contract manufacturing companies. We were number nine. We were able to leapfrog everyone and get into position one. Okay, so. That talks a bit to your question as well around responsiveness. But let me go to the, the cardinal question. I mean, how, how do you manage a WTO dynamic next time around? My, my view is that if, if you, and I know that's why you asked the question, if you've got a model, a blueprint that's worked previously, I'm not sure that, and I'm not saying that uh, WTO is irrelevant when it comes to public health issues because there, there are, uh, you know, there, there is legislation and there is a TRIPS agreement and all of that and South Africa are signatories to that, we understand that. But, you know, kind of uh, try and tell a person who sent you a WhatsApp message like the late Jabu Mabuza, who many of you in this room know, and uh, he sent me a message and he said to me, uh, Stabby, my brother, I've lost my brother to COVID. And I'm really worried that if I get it, I might go the same way. Now, you tell the late Jabu or his family about WTO and waivers and see what response you're going to get, right? So we need to get practical and real about what is possible. And we've got this blueprint. We need to just keep using it. Now, let me drift into another area, Lawazi, that you raised. And that is the area of non-communicable diseases. Grossly understated and underestimated on the continent. More Africans lost their lives to diabetes mellitus than did to COVID. Okay, it's a fact. Now... If during a, a once-in-a-lifetime pandemic, you tell me something else cost more lives, then what on earth are we doing? Okay, we've got to start addressing in an aggressive fashion NCDs. Now, what are the primary NCDs here we need to be addressing? There's a rising tide of diabetes, a rising tide of, of cancers, all types of cancers. If I look at, um, if I look at males and female cancers, so the women cancer... You've got breast cancer, cervical cancer, lung cancer, colorectal cancer, right? In, in that order. Males, you've got prostatic cancer. 
we've got uh, also lung cancer, also colorectal cancer. And, and this kind of varies a bit from country to country, right, depending on some of the environmental factors, etc. The bottom line, however, remains that immunotherapy for, for cancer is becoming uh, an increasingly preferred way to treat these because the, the, the MABs, the NIBs, are so good. We don't have a CAR T registered yet, Judy, am I right? There's no CAR T, T, uh, CAR -T yet, but there will be one imminently, right? So if these are targeted therapies, so let me take trastuzumab, for example, uh, which responds to a HER2 type uh, of cancer, it's responsive, and gives you a 94% efficacy. Why would you want to subject a patient to, well, the standard treatment is of a, of either a, a, a bilateral or a single mastectomy, um, and then they go into chemo and radio and all of that, when you've got targeted therapies. And that's what immunotherapy does. It, it targets, um, the, the efficacy rates increase significantly. Um, a few years ago, if you had lung cancer, 30, uh, my dad died from lung cancer in 1982. I mean, there were just no treatment options in those days. I mean, I remember like running around as a 16-year-old, but there must be something we can do here, doctor. Well, please, you've got to do something. Eh? There were no cancer treatments. Today, there are over 45 cancer, am I right, lung cancer treatments, Judy, around 45. So it just shows you how things have progressed. But what is the use of progress, Luwazi, if the patients can't access these, um, these biologics and or biosimilar products? Because they set you back two, three million rand a shot. Okay. So we have to become seized with solving that problem. But that problem can also be solved in part by having your own local manufacturing capacities. If you've got that, then it's a bit like having the ARV discussion in a way. So just in conclusion, because I know we've only got eight minutes left, and I've tried to drag this on as much as I could. I hope I've done a good job, because I recognize we're only two panelists. But the point remains that you are absolutely nowhere in any conversation unless you've got local capacities. And, and it kind of pains me because I, I went to Witts Medical School in the, in the 80s, right? The mid-80s. And if I look at the field of oncology, we, we were really up there with the best. But now because of this inaccessibility issue, and they call it a shrinking market issue, We've lost time and we've lost where we were originally. Now, you can do that because one thing having the treatment, but what about the biomarkers and the diagnosis and all of that, right? You have to solve both problems. You've got to solve three problems. Okay, you've, you've got to have the equipment in the healthcare system, you've got to have the diagnostics, and then you've got to have the therapeutics, right? So all of those kind of work in one, but you can only achieve that, right? If you've got local capacity. So we keep defaulting this thing of local capacity. So to end off, on local capacity, we need four things, and these are the four take-home messages I'd like to leave you with today. If you remember anything of what I said, just remember these four things. Number one, the procurement of our medicines on the continent and in our own country has to be reorientated so we can sustain local production, number one. We owe it to ourselves and our citizens, not only from a health security perspective, but also we cannot continue burdening our economies because we are importing things and, uh, and, and, and uh, getting a rising tide of, of trade deficits that are hard currency denominated. We cannot have that any longer. Number two, we, we need to pay further attention through some policy interventions around strengthening our healthcare systems so that we can deliver and administer these drugs to the population, the citizenry of our countries. Number three, we need co a consolidation of data to understand. The data exists. We've just got to consolidate it 
so that we know where and how to prioritize to understand where is the prevalence where is the incidence and then the very last thing is africa needs its own procurement mechanism and pooled funding okay so when we look at uh, healthcare expenditure, we say, well, oh, geez, it's an expense, and the fiscus and treasury, they get very nervous. Well, healthcare, and I'm sure you've heard this many times, healthcare is not an expenditure, it's an investment. Because if you don't invest in your population, you're not going to have a productive population. And the productive population means you can never get health or economic security in our lifetime. So those are the four things in from all of the questions that Luazi has raised today and very relevant ones. Those are the four things we need to probably get right. If we get that right, we can start talking uh, meaningfully about health security and health sovereignty because we, we keep talking about it. But are we really serious when we don't do the basics? Those are the four basic things. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Stavros. Appreciating that we are running out of time. Um, there's a lot of uh, I issues that we've um, skipped over that I was hoping to tackle, but let's tackle the issue of the market shaping just for one second. We can spend a few minutes on that. Now, um, to simplify uh, the, the situation or, or the, the, the discussion, somebody's got to buy all of uh, these products, right? And if you want to group the buyers, you basically kind of have three main groups. You can you can let me know if I've, I've skipped one. But um, you've got um, your major multilateral organizations like your Gavis, your UNICEFs, etc., uh, who buy on behalf of um, low-income countries. You then have uh, sovereign states, and many of them also <coughs> invest in the R and D as well. Um, and then you can maybe just lump together the whole private uh, sector and say that you have the private sector also buying. I don't know if I've missed another major grouping, but that's basically your buyers, right? Now, Africa wants to produce substantial, wants to uh, substantively in increase and exponentially increase the products that it puts out. And let's suppose we get the financing to do that, you get the financing for the R&D, we are pushing out the product that we want. Now, these entities that are buying, each of them would need to have a different approach to actually becoming themselves an enabler of African manufacturing. You would need to actually carve out a corridor of, uh, or a special dispensation to do this, you cannot do it um, using the current, you know, uh, market models that exist. So I would like to just get a few tidbits from you on how these entities can start to think innovatively about being agents of uh, manufacturing diversity, not just for the continent but the world as well. Thanks, uh, Luazi. Um, I, I think the answer, you, you're quite right, those are the three main groupings of, of procurers, right? And if, if those procurers are not going to buy locally and sustain local production, you're going to be right back to square one where you were in, uh, in, in, in October or November of 2020 when we started realizing that Africa was not going to get vaccines. We were at the back end of the queue. So we can talk and say a lot about reducing our 99% import burden. Currently, we import 99% of the vaccines on the continent. We can say we want to reduce that down to uh, importing only 40% by 2040. But that's kind of wishful thinking, unless there's a commitment to buy from African producers for Africa. Right? So I find it, quite frankly, a little offensive that people are saying to our own people here, people outside of the continent are saying, listen, we, we're prepared to help you, but you know, buy vaccines from outside the continent. Is it like kind of saying almost we don't trust you with your own vaccines on the continent? That's kind of the sense I get. I'm sorry, it's a bit offensive. I'm sorry to say that. 
So either the multilateral procurement agencies and or uh, entities, either they are going to reorientate their, their procurement mechanism or my fourth point that I made earlier, we must set up our own procurement as a continent. Okay. But charity has to start at home. And I'm afraid we haven't got it right yet in South Africa either because we import most of our medicines into South Africa. And I look at the antiretroviral tender, which was awarded six weeks ago. Okay. Now, there's an imported product that is seven rand a pack more expensive, but yet Adcock Ingram, a local producer, got zero on the tender. It doesn't make sense to me. I mean, how is that going to enhance local production? You're destroying local production. You're deindustrializing. So I'm afraid charity has to start at home here as well. So, Luwazi, in conclusion, on it, what needs to be done, right? I think that the multilateral organizations need to be put onto terms, okay, as has happened. And who must put them onto terms? Sorry. The African Union, okay. The AU was put out a very clear statement on the 17th of May 2022. It says clear cut a statement around this issue. They say we want you to buy 30% of Africa's requirements from Africa. In fairness, Gavi have put out a white paper as a response to that. The PAVM, which you were part of, Luwazi, has hosted a conference. But I'm still not comfortable that the practical elements that you need to follow through on this, they are still lacking. So I think we're on a watching brief to see if this happens or doesn't happen. My suggestion is if we can't get this right through multilateral, we must have our own procurement mechanism with a set aside where the African governments all say, listen, we are setting aside 30% of the volume as a minimum for the continent to the local producers. Otherwise, quite honestly, why would anyone proceed with putting up a plant in Kenya, as has been touted in Rwanda, the, um, the Senegalese are looking at one, why put it up? if in two years' time you're going to shut it down and retrench a thousand people in the process. People are not yo-yos where you kind of switch them on and off. Mm. You know, you train up people, then you lose them. Okay, it, uh, it, it can't. And can I tell you the, the saddest, the most tragic thing for me, guys, colleagues, is not only do we shut down facilities, but we every one of us here, somehow academically, sits and agitates that we've got to have better skilled scientists, um, uh, healthcare workers coming out of our institutions, right? So we go and we skill all these people, PhDs and masters and all sorts of things, double PhDs, and guess what? They land up working in the States or in Europe or somewhere else because we don't sustain the capacities here for them to stay in our country. So why train them in the first place? It's a tragedy. So this has to end. The answer is either procurement agencies, Luazi, put a set aside, they designate a fixed volume for every single procurement uh, transaction that takes place, whether it's a tender or otherwise. Okay. And if they cannot do it, we must set up our own procurement mechanism with our own funding and we must ensure that we sustain the capacity on the continent if we don't, next pandemic, we will be at the back end of the queue again because right. you started off the session and I'm going to end off the session by saying that when COVID broke out in January and February 2020, we all came together and said in, we must stand together in solidarity and help each other, right? Well, well guess what? It was like Hunger Games. Do any of you watch <laughs> Hunger Games? <laughs> where it's every man or woman for himself. You don't, in fact, you have to kill the person next to you to survive. And I'm afraid I'm going to be as callous enough to say that's how it felt for me as an African. Sitting on the African continent, that's what I felt. I felt that we were, I was playing a game of Hunger Games and my phone was full every single day 
with people saying, Steph, like the late Jabu Mabuza, please get me a vaccine. Mm. You know, those people die. They could have been saved. Mm. We cannot ever have a rerun of Home Good Games ever, ever again. And the only way we can prevent it is we've got to take charge and control of our own procurement. And if we do that, we will ensure our own future. We cannot depend on others for our own future. Thanks very much, Therese. Thank you so much, uh, Stavros. I actually do have one more question oh. for you, but I'm going to just first check with the audience if there's anybody who has anything they want to either say or ask. Um, yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah, please go to the mic, because I think uh, the colleagues at the back weren't here. While she's going there, uh, Stavros, um, she'll ask a question, and I just want to ask you, Stavros, the issue of, um, of volume and premium, right, is going to be a big issue for us for the next probably five to ten years. And um, could you please give us your insights about how particularly if we were to set up a full procurement mechanism, what we have actually, but we, we need to kind of formalize it and, and, and all of that um, and set it up and institutionalize it, but how are we going to accommodate the issue of volume and premium, both as, as issues separately and also as issues together. Ma'am, please introduce yourself first and, uh, and then you. ask your question. Um, so my name is Faith Mongwai and I work for uh, JMA Sadak, or Jamie Saving the Time, and um, the technical team lead for the Ankivet Viral Value Chain. And it's a project that's looking to um, promote industrialization of the pharmaceutical sector particularly looking at um, ARVs. So when you spoke a lot about ARVs, um, my ears hopped up because that's something that I see every day. Um, so we, when we spoke about full procurement, um, I know our SADC Secretariat is trying to coordinate um, the SADC full procurement. And one of the biggest challenges, um, is at least in government buy-in, I know you're saying we should have the AU coming in, but the local governments themselves, they have a facility uh, to do full procurement and give preference to, to local manufacturers, but it's sort of something that's been dead in the water, but it's been spoken about for several years. Countries have signed, but there's no buy-in. Um, then you spoke again about building local capacity. So in our project, uh, because of the COVID pandemic, we started giving out grants, a form of blended financing um, to local companies to produce commodities for COVID-19 uh, in the Sadiq region. And I can tell you right now that some of the companies have stopped producing because the local government isn't buying, even though um, there question. is yeah. local premium and uh, price preference for local manufacturing. But even still, um, the governments are just preferring international, uh, you know, manufacturers. So then, my question becomes: Is it, is it really about the industry, or are we not really putting our governments to task and mm. asking them, "Hey, why aren't you buying?" Because I can tell you with my own experience and own eyes. The, I, the private sector wants to participate. They are willing to invest. Um, international uh, companies are willing to invest into the region, but the truth of the matter is our governments are not buying. Mm. And until we change that and start holding our governments to task, I don't see the pharmaceutical sector growing at all. We'll, 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 we'll be here in 2040 mm. saying uh, we have the industry but there's nobody buying because mm. that's the, the truth. Mm. Then the second question I have is about raw materials. So um, you spoke a lot about building capacity, but if you look, for example, at the ARV value chain, all the active pharmaceutical ingredients, which is 80% of the cost, are coming from India or China. So how then do we local producers compete when uh, all the primary raw materials are coming um, from China, and how can we then compete with those multinationals when multilateral companies, um, sorry, organizations like Global Fund will tell you, we want to only buy cheapest first, not because it's manufactured in Africa. So how are we going to produce the most economic product when all our raw materials are coming from the same company that we are competing to bid against 
for a global funds tender. I think those, I don't know, those are my two questions. Mm. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, so, um, I'm gonna let Stavros answer. I also have an answer for you as well from the political side of things, and then we'll take your question and yours will be the last one. Okay, Lawazi, I'm gonna let you handle the political question as you said, right? <laughs> So your, your question, Luwazi, actually segued into, into the ladies' yeah. two questions, right? And th this thing of um, charity starting at home, as I said, let me, let me explain a little more what that is. Interestingly, I remember having a two-hour discussion with President Festus Makai on this, your, your former president, right? Who happened to be one of the HIV champions as well, you might know. Um, and there isn't a president who you don't speak to that buys into this. But then what is the problem below that? Why are we still failing to implement this? And I'll tell you what the failure is. The failure is that you've got Treasury, the Fiscus, who are saying we are going to, in the South African instance, we are going to allocate 260 billion rand for healthcare. Yeah. Now that's a shrinking budget. It might have been 250 last time, Luazi, when you were there. But, it's, but you might have gone up 10, but it hasn't. In real terms, it's shrunk, yeah. right? Okay. So the health ministers are going to say, and the particularly the director generals of health, or the permanent secretaries in your case, are going to say, but we've got a finite amount, and I've got to make sure I can stretch that rand as, as far as I can, okay. Then you've got the trade and industry departments. And the trade and industry have well, got to industrialize this economy, right? And health will say, fine, we'll buy everything locally, but if there's a premium, uh, you know, Mr. or Mrs. DTI, you must pick up the cost, okay. <laughs> so you get caught in the, this keeps falling through the cracks. Every year it keeps falling through the cracks, right? So, and I can tell you that I've, I've watched this movie a hundred times and that's the single biggest failing that you cannot get aligned between four ministries in government. And the four ministries are health, trade, industry and competition. Um, in some countries it's called economy, treasury and science and technology. And they, and they all, I've watched it on the concert that, except for in Egypt, they all work in silos and you never get it right. Okay. Now, what should logic prevail? Logic should prevail the following. Let's say you're procuring ARVs, right? You're trying to stretch that pooler, right? But let's analyze that for a moment. Let's say you can pay one pooler less per pack of antiretroviral, and you're buying 10 million packs. So you can argue you've saved 10 million pooler by importing the product. So everyone will pat themselves as a good decision. Right? It's actually a terrible decision because you've lost three pooler worth of tax and economic multiplier benefit. So in that instance, you've actually lost 20 million pooler in the example I'm giving you. It's a terrible decision. Who's ever making that decision should be fired. But I'm yet to see anyone in health be fired or anything like that, right? It just doesn't happen because it becomes very emotive. So the only way you can look at this is don't look at are you paying more or less. Mm. You must look at what constitutes best value for money. That must be the only procurement decision. And if it's the imported product, okay, because they're six rand or six pula cheaper, and your economic benefits are only going to be five, well, then you've got your answer. Then you've got an uncompetitive industry. Cannot sustain. Right. So the biggest challenge, and I'm going to allow uh, Luazi to come in, because this, is, this requires political will, the strongest political mm -hmm. will. We need to aggregate our volumes on the continent, because obviously if you ask Mauritius or ask Botswana with 1.8 million people is that right there or thereabouts to try and compete against india who's got 1.4 billion people guess what's going to happen right 
But if we aggregate our volumes on the continent, we can get the economies of scale. So in summary, what would be my four-point plan to galvanize in pharmaceutical industrialization and localization on the continent? Number one, let's get aggregated volumes. Number two, a mindset that says we're going to procure what gives us best value for money, not what is the cheapest, because the cheapest lands up costing the fiscus more. Mm. It's crazy. And, and just on the second point, I'll, I'll never forget Strive, my CEO, who was heading up Abbott. I remember speaking to him probably in January 2021. And, and he's, he's, a, uh, he's a telecoms guy. And he said to me, Stavros, you know, I can't understand you pharma guys. He said, how did you allow on this continent all your volumes to be outsourced to India for all the jobs, taxes, and economic value to be retained there? And you guys sat back and did nothing about it on the continent. He's right. I couldn't argue. I was speechless. Okay, so that's number two. Number three, this thing of boom bust tenders needs to go away okay <laughs> no investor is going to invest a single cent if you're going to ask an investor to invest and you might have the business after two years or you might not it's crazy imagine putting up a power plant and say look we'll give you an off take for two years but uh, after two years you're on your own you might who's going to want to invest okay they'll go and invest in chile or they'll invest in Brazil where they give there's protection for pharma companies, okay? Or in Egypt. That's what they'll do. So what do we need? We need long-term contracts, guaranteed off-takes with reference pricing. If you've got a reference price, so you don't get the rent-seeking that goes on with it, right? So that's point number three of the four-point plan. Point number four is create an enabling and conducive environment for technology transfers to take place, which was your point around you, you competing against your supplier. They're going to kill you, right? That's why you've got to get those agreements going. And those agreements in themselves will give you uh, economies of scale. Now, if up to point four hasn't worked, as a very, very last resort, you can consider duties. I personally don't like duties. I like the threat of duties, what that might do. It acts as a deterrent, but I, I think you're far better off localizing by having guaranteed off-takes, long-term agreements with price references. That is the recipe for success for the future. Thanks. And you needn't pay a premium, by the way, because the premium, a, a study was done in 2007 by the IDC Economic Research Unit for, for ARVs. And they found that for every um, one rand of imported ARV, we were losing 32 cents back into the economy. So put differently, you could entertain a 32% premium in that instance. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you so much. While I answer my question, uh, if we could ask the lady to make her way, by the time you get there, I'll be done, hopefully, with my answer. Um, so the issue of uh, member states, um, uh, being convinced to really put in the necessary investments to actually purchase is something that we are indeed dealing with through the championship of President Ramaphosa. So I will just let you, I'll just tell you because it's, uh, it was something that was publicly announced before, but we are now awaiting uh, the decisions of the media coordinating meeting that indeed President Ramaphosa did table um, a recommendation that uh, there be uh, a uh, some kind of a dispensation, or what, what, that, what that will look at like, will unpack uh, some more, but there does need to be some kind of dispensation where we do say that uh, collectively as a continent, when we've aggregated our volumes, all the things that Stavros has spoken about, um, you know, that I in fact we will uh, be preferentially procuring uh, from African producers. So that's the first aspect. The second aspect is that we will need to commit to the low volumes and the premium, you know, 
um, because a lot of the time people come back and they say, oh, but the volumes are too low, you know, even if they're happy to pay the, the price, you know, the volumes are too low, we might as well order from people who are going to actually be able to meet <laughs> the volumes. But we must actually commit to these low volumes, uh, so that means carving out a special dispensation as well. But critically, the reason why putting these recommendations through the president direct to the heads of state as opposed to working through uh, the model of AU policy um, organs is that the decision gets made by heads of state, right? And that is the critical strategic element because exactly as Stavros was saying, it is about bringing together the various departments and the various ministers and saying that this decision has been actually taken by the heads of state, you must now implement it without question. You must find a way of implementing it. Now, that is something that um, we are uh, battling through. In fact, we were relaying to President Mapos at the last COVID-19 Commission that one of the problems we're having is that you, heads of state, take wise decisions at the heads of state level. You table these things, you make a decision, but then the ministers don't follow through. So we need to actually find a mechanism to ensure that the ministers follow through. And it takes me back to the issue of binding uh, legal agreements. You know, you can have your soft agreements like your, uh, you know, some of these uh, soft agreements that we have, trade agreements, uh, AFTCA, I mean, th those are all fairly soft. They're not binding, you know. So um, the issue is to actually, w once you've decided that you want to have some kind of a pact as a continent, it, it, it's really, really important to look at what level these agreements become binding. They become binding on the heads of states and therefore become binding on their cohorts, uh, on their cabinet as well, to implement and to implement in a, in a coordinate way, because it does actually take the whole of cabinet to implement these kinds of decisions, particularly when it comes to health. So we are working on it. You are quite correct. It is a major, major problem. And then one last element that I just want to bring in is that this is now also where Abuja becomes really, really critical. We've got to invoke Abuja aggressively. We've got to get people to actually pay attention to Abuja because there's no way that these governments are going to be able to spend unless they actually crank up the percentage of spend into, in, into health as well. You know, Then they must find a way to actually replenish their fiscus as well. Um, so Abuja becomes quite, quite critical as well um, in this regard. Last question, and then I must actually go to the next session. I realize I'm uh, running out of time myself. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Salata. From actually what you just said, actually comes up to actually give me the, the question <laughs> that I have in a better perspective. Um, I'm Akwana Vuma from 870 Pharma. My question, more like actually I'm seeking that you can comment, both of you, on this issue because as much as we can have all these policies that are coming, as much as we can have these legally binding agreements and all that, there's still the human factor element to that. And with this human factor comes a question of ethics because at the end of the day, for this human to comply, what are the measures that will be taken if it is that they do not, com um, they do not follow up on the legally binding agreement? Because right now you can see that as South Africa, we stuck with situation whereby um, ministers and other political leaders, they knew that they were supposed to do one to three, but in all of these commissions that are finding them guilty and so forth and so forth, there's still really no practical punitive measure or any payback system that, okay, they did this wrong, didn't follow this policy, therefore at least there is this measure that can be taken to ensure that whatever wrong that they did, whatever legally binding um, agreement that they were supposed to follow that they didn't follow actually does come to um, benefit the communities that have been failed by that human being who did not follow suit as far as what was supposed to have been done when it comes to the implementation of these policies. So I just want to get your comment on that part as to with all of these issues that you've indicated, how do we make the human aspect that is the front end of to actually implement and ignore it if there's no implementation, that there is follow up and that is practical for the communities facing it. Thank you. One minute, Stavros, please, on accountability. Well, well, the first thing you can do is you can make Lawazi president. 
and, and, and sh she'll make sure they, their regular cabinet reshuffles. <laughs> <laughs> so look, look I, th I think it's a, it's, it's a very complex area for me to uh, sort of answer in a minute, uh, virtually impossible. The only thing I can say is that wh when policies are not implemented uh, by, by government, uh, there are... There, there are entities like the Auditor General, for example. You know, maybe the AG should be looking at this and saying, but this is a policy. We, we did an audit and 90% of the ARVs were imported. So please answer, and uh, whether it's through parliamentary oversight where you've got to go and, uh, you know, you did that often, the WASI, where you've got to go and account to parliament or otherwise. Now, I think we've got to start using those agencies are a lot more effective as a citizenry in the country. So I, I know we've been, I suppose, traumatized is the right word, by, uh, you know, things like what was in the Zondo Commission and all the rest of it. So we're like a bit traumatized here. And uh, to a degree, our institutions have been so preoccupied with that that very often they don't have the time to look into the bread and butter stuff, like are we following a localization or implementation policy, which is an express policy of the country. Now, I'll just say one last thing, is that in, in the current, uh, I mean, there's not a single person in this room that wasn't touched by COVID, economically speaking, not one. And the economic reconstruction and recovery plan of the country places, infrastructure, and localization at the front and center of economic recovery. Now, if localization is not taking place, seconds, okay, then I think as a citizenry, you've got every right to report this to these institutions, the Chapter 9 institutions or others. I think that is on the only way I think that you're going to make a point here is if that happens. Otherwise, you're going to get much of the same, guys. But look, it all starts with the political willingness yeah. and the buy-in. I mean, uh, in the last five seconds, we are looking at a study right now to say what is the economic multiplier benefit back into the economy when you produce a pharmaceutical care vis-a-vis -vis importing it. That will also help to educate the different departments, the different ministries, etc. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, I've been asked to uh, really end the session, and I do need to go into the next session, so I won't be able to answer. But indeed, the issue of accountability, accountability frameworks, you know, is very much a, an, a whole other discussion, which you probably should have had a whole session on. Um, so I think we need to actually maybe ask Msomi to find us uh, an opportunity to unpack that. We could maybe do it as a virtual kind of side event, you know. Um, so I think uh, let's park that for that and we'll discuss that with uh, Dr. Msomi. But thank you very much to the audience. I think you, you I, so I was looking at the faces. You seemed to be incredibly engaged and uh, we really appreciate uh, this and I hope that um, we've had a nice provocative discussion for you to really you know, consider um, some of the issues um, and take them forward in your various constituencies. So with that, I'd like to thank you and we can move on to the next sessions. Thank you so much, colleagues. <laughs>